Hi, this is Jason Nickleby, Assistant Director with the Minnesota State High School League, and this is Basketball Officiating Training Tape number six. This is the first tape that we will not have for credit on Arbiter. This will be placed on YouTube, and you can view it at your convenience. And again, we're sending these to all coaches and ADs and officials, and you can uh, take a look at this tape as well as the previous five on the MSHSL officials YouTube account. Um, again, when we're looking at these plays, not picking on any one team or player or official or crew, just trying to learn from these plays and have a great discussion uh, amongst our crews as we prepare for the final month of the re regular season here. So uh, doing a great job, keep it up. Uh, appreciate your, your diligence and your work. Basketball is a long season and uh, I understand how that goes fully. So uh, again, keep up the good work, proud of you all. And with that, let's take a look at some plays. On this one, I wanna talk positioning and mechanics and primary coverage areas. So you'll see that we have a drive and a play that starts in front of the trail and then makes its way across the lane line and then down the lane line nearest uh, the center. And the center does a really nice job of adjusting his position to see this play start, develop, and finish. And because he makes that position adjustment, he is able to see this contact from behind because the dribbler gets her head and shoulders past the primary defender. Therefore, that defender does not have legal guarding position anymore. And so contact that is made with the shooter, the dribbler, uh, shooter in this case, it would be a foul charge to the defense properly. So the, the secondary defender who rises vertically in her plane is perfectly legal, has a clean block, that's all good, but the defender that was the primary defender and gets beat comes from behind and plays uh, through the shooter is properly called for a foul. But mainly our position adjust by the center is excellent, um, great job of moving down. If we can be stationary at the time of contact, that's ideal, but we do a nice job of adjusting to see this. Only move if we need to move, and we do here, and that's great. And then also from a primary coverage perspective, remember any time that we have a drive to the basket on the center side of the lane, drawing a, a line down the middle of the paint, that is the center's primary responsibility and that is the only whistle we have on this play. So this is outstanding uh, mechanics, position adjust, and also great partner trust by the two crewmates to allow the center to take this play all the way to the basket. So this is really well done by the crew, in particular the C on this play. On this play, I wanna talk about legal guarding position and maintaining that legally um, and protecting the shooter all the way to the floor. So you see we have a dribble drive to the basket on the lead side right off of a transition. Uh, lead and center are in good position uh, to officiate this play. Uh, trail, we keep up with the player in the backcourt and that's great. Let's get down to the 28 foot mark. We do get there eventually and get stationary, so that's great. Um, but lead, you were in good position um, and you adjusted to even maybe a better position, but let's be stationary and let's pick up the secondary defender. If you notice here on this drive, the primary defender gets beat, head and shoulders are past the torso of the defender. So therefore, when he doesn't allow this player to land and there's contact, this is a blocking foul. Now, this is not a restricted area blocking foul because this is the original primary defender who does not maintain legal guarding position. And then when contact is made, when the shooter rises to shoot and then comes down and makes contact before hitting the floor, this is just a regular blocking foul. So we wouldn't call this as a restricted area blocking foul, but just want us to be aware of, first of all, legal guardian position, do they maintain it? Or well, first of all, do they establish it? And secondly, do they maintain it legally? And if they don't, if there's contact, that should be charged to the defensive player. And we need to protect shooters, make sure that 
if a defensive player does not have legal guardian position, make sure that the shooter is afforded the opportunity to go all the way up, shoot, and come down without contact. And if they do, we should be putting air in the whistle and charging them with a foul. Transition play here with the steal, and we have good hustle by the lead to get down in position. Again, um, as we've talked about in previous tapes, it's ideal to get to the end line and get stationary as this play uh, develops. But if we can't, stop at the free throw line, extend it, and take it from there. But I think in this case, uh, we are close enough um, to the end line at the time of this action that we have a pretty good view of what occurs. And uh, first of all, we have a uh, cl clean swipe at the ball by the defensive player, and the ball gets away from the dribbler temporarily, and this is an interrupted dribble. So the dribbler can get to it and begin that dribble again, um, can secure the ball and pass or shoot, um, if they run through a, a legal defender, it would be a team control foul, not a player control foul if they don't have player control, uh, but they still have team control in this case. But it is a clean swipe by the defensive player. And then we ultimately have a shooting foul properly called uh, by the lead. Good patient whistle. Allow the player to gather the basketball here and give two shots, even though the ball never really gets off of the hand of the shooter. This is definitely a shooting foul. And we close in on the action as we call the foul, officiate uh, in the dead ball period, and then wait for our partner to take our spot before moving to the table. So this is really well done by the lead. Good hustle. Uh, good job of not calling a foul on that initial swipe of the defensive player. And then a nice job of awarding shots. Good patient whistle and excellent spot mechanics, closing in on the play, uh, and then moving to the table to report. Well done. Everything about this play, mechanically, position-wise, and our adjustments during the play is excellent. Uh, the only thing I would mention on this play is as we talked about on the previous play, is just having a patient whistle and allowing the offensive player to get shots, um, free throws whenever possible. So uh, in this case, you know, notice that uh, we position adjust, lead mirrors the basketball, trail works at the 28 foot mark, and we're all in perfect position to view the action that occurs in this play. But when we have this cut to the basket by the offensive player, we allow the defensive benefit by committing a foul. And I think if we had a little bit more patient whistle, I think we could have given shots potentially here. Um, either we need to get the foul a lot sooner up near the elbow, or we need to allow this play to play out uh, and have a little bit more patience because again, the defense benefited here by committing a foul, they got a throw in, they were beat um, and held, it's definitely a foul, but see if we can have a patient whistle, provide shots when when the opportunity presents itself. Um, but our, our coverage, our positioning, excellent, our position adjusts, et cetera. Just let's consider um, having a patient whistle and giving them free throws when, when we can. Um, again, we don't want the defense or the player committing a foul to benefit by committing the foul unless the foul is so clearly before they gather the basketball, et cetera, that we know, have no other choice but to have a throw in. So uh, good coverage, good mechanics. Uh, just think about the patient whistle piece uh, when we can. On this play, we have a dribble drive to the basket right in front of the lead, and we're going to have a proper no call at the basket uh, by the lead for this contact. You'll notice that the defender establishes legal guarding position in the restricted area, which means it would be a restricted area blocking foul if this contact occurred with number 24 while grounded, except 
He rises vertically in his space, A to A, doesn't move from one spot to another and make contact with the shooter. Therefore, this contact is legal. He rises vertically, no problem. It's not enough for an offensive foul. So no call is the proper call on this particular play. The lead is in really good position to view this play. This is his primary responsibility and he no calls it. The C does work lower to assist and that's great. Lead, your position was great to start with. Let's just stay put. Don't work your way out towards the sideline. Just stay where you are. You were in great position, stay there. Um, and I think that beyond the fact that we no called this, which is proper, we also have the former offensive team making contact with the basketball while he's standing out of bounds. And I think if we just stay put in our stationary, maybe we have a better shot at this. Notice that on the rebound here, he does is, is touching the basketball. Therefore, we should have a throw in for the team in white on the end line. So um, overall, good no call, good judgment of A to A, like the positioning and our uh, judgment here. Just be aware of the out of bounds piece. Um, and our position after the contact. But overall, really well done on this play by the crew, in particular by the lead. On this one, the ball handler number two will get past his primary defender, get his head and shoulders past the torso, and then encounter a secondary defender who is grounded in the restricted area. Now, again, as we've talked about a number of times on these tapes, just because the contact is not real significant does not mean that we no call these, these plays any longer. And notice the lead uses the walled up signal, indicating that the defensive player has legal guarding position and is straight up at the time of contact. If his legal guarding position was established outside of the restricted area and then he retreated, into the restricted area and contact was made with a grounded secondary defender, this would be a no call and that would be the correct ruling. In this case, he establishes initial legal guardian position in the restricted area. He is grounded at the time of contact. Therefore, this should be a restricted area blocking foul. And again, um, we've shown a number of these type plays on training tapes. We need to call this as a restricted area blocking foul. We cannot no call this play any longer. Um, we've been going at the restricted area rule for a handful of years now. And we need to understand that anytime we have a secondary defender that is grounded in the restricted area and contact is made with that player, it should be called as a restricted area blocking foul. And that is the primary responsibility of the lead. So let's keep that in mind as the lead. Uh, when we have this type of play. Let's talk about traveling considerations and again legal guardian position which we've talked about a number of times in primary coverage. You see here we have a drive down the middle of the paint. She comes to a stop, picks up the pivot foot to shoot and then goes to the ground and throws the ball out of bounds and a throw in is awarded to the defense. So let's start with the, the traveling aspect of it. So because this is not involving a secondary defender, this action is going to be the primary responsibility of the center. And you see the center has a closely guarded count that he has started as this is his primary area of coverage. So that is, that is excellent, that is proper, that's what we wanna see. Then we need to pick up the pivot foot. Again, we can call it whatever we want to call it, Euro step, drop step, um, et cetera. We're just picking up the pivot foot. If they pick up the pivot foot, they can shoot or pass. If they start a dribble after picking up the pivot foot, that would be a traveling violation. But if they pick it up to shoot or pass, no problem. In this case, they pick up the pivot foot, don't put it back down but then we have the judgment of whether or not a foul occurs. So a no call for traveling is proper, but in this case, the defender has legal guardian position, maintains it legally, doesn't move into the shooter, maintains her position, and the shooter accidentally trips over 
her leg while she is maintaining legal guarding uh, position. So a no call is the proper call here. Again, ugly or unusual doesn't necessarily mean that it's illegal. We need to pick up the pivot foot, pick up the defender. Do they have legal guardian position, et cetera? Who's responsible for the contact? In this case, uh, it is not a traveling violation and that's properly not called. And then the defensive player has legal position and contact while marginal is responsible on the offense, the responsibilities on the offensive player, therefore a no call for a foul on this play is also proper. So well handled by the crew, just reminder on primary coverage areas, traveling and legal guardian position considerations. On this play, we have a drive right down the paint with a pass and crash where the offensive player is properly called for a team control foul. So first of all, trail, let's make sure we get down to the 28 foot mark. Um, again, we're responsible for uh, this dribble drive as it's in that free throw line half circle. Um, so if anything occurred in that area, we would be responsible for it as a trail and we would need to be at the 28 foot mark to officiate that action. In this case, nothing happens till it gets into the paint. And remember, any time that a uh, offensive player encounters a secondary defender, the responsibility for ruling on that contact is the lead um, anywhere in the paint. So in this case, uh, number two, even though it's really high in the paint and it's not a secondary or a secondary defender that's grounded in the restricted area type play, uh, the lead is still responsible uh, for this. And then on the pass and crash action, the lead would be responsible for the crash and the trail would go with the ball uh, regardless of whether it was a secondary defender involved or not. So. The proper coverage here is to have the lead take this and the trail will take uh, the pass. So well handled by the lead, proper call for an offensive foul. Number two establishes legal guardian position and the offensive player plays through his chest. This is a proper call for a team control foul and uh, the lead is the primary official for ruling on this as it happens in this play. So really well done by the crew and the lead on this play. On this play, we have an excellent example of off-ball officiating by the center who picks up a defensive player pushing through a legal screen. So first, we come down and get into really good uh, initial position. This allows us to pick this up. We're also not ball watching. That's the best part about this is that we pick up this action off the ball. We don't stare at that player right in front of the bench. We don't stare at the trajectory of the ball. Uh, we're picking up those players in our primary coverage area and we're able to pick this up. So this is uh, really well done uh, by the center. The lead doesn't have a chance to initiate a rotation. They just got in the front, in the front court. Um, so this is gonna be the center's responsibility all the way, unless lead, if you can pick up that uh, player pushing through the screen from your position, which you might be able to do, you could help assist if for some reason the center can't pick this up. But really well done by the center. Good positioning, good off ball vision. That's exactly where we need to be looking. And then also excellent job of putting the throw in in the correct spot because the spot of the foul was within that area that would uh, provide a throw in on the end line. So overall excellent positioning, mechanics, uh, judgment and vision on this play by the center. On this transition play, we're going to have an illegal dribble that's picked up correctly by the center official in transition. So first of all, when we are looking at these types of plays, uh, we need to understand the definition of a dribble and when it starts and when it ends and how that would constitute an illegal dribble. And a player cannot start a another dribble after the first one has ended 
and the first dribble has ended once it is touched with both hands simultaneously, which is what occurs in this particular situation. And then we put the throw in at the proper spot because anytime we have a throw in in the backcourt off of a violation, we will have a throw in at the sideline nearest uh, to where the violation occurred and we would have a 35 second shot clock. So very well handled in transition by the center official, uh, proper rules knowledge and judgment, and then good job of putting the throw in in the correct place. On this play, we're going to have a dribble drive into the paint, originating from the trails responsibility and ending up in the leads. And we're going to have a foul that's called from the trail uh, position. So uh, remember trails when the drive is going away from you into the leads area, we're going to defer to them and let them live and die with a call in their respective area. Uh, we're gonna trust them to uh, make the call that needs to be made or no call, uh, depending on the situation. And the lead's in perfect position, and it should be uh, their their call to make. Do I think this is a foul? Yes, I think it's a foul. I think the defensive player moves into the shooter and is properly given two shots. I just don't think this call should come from trail. I believe it should come from lead because once it gets past that line from the elbow to the three-point line on the end line there, uh, it is in the lead's primary area of responsibility and should come from the lead. And if it doesn't come from lead, then it should come from C, who is looking straight in at it um, and also doesn't have a whistle. So a couple things to consider here, primary coverage areas, who's responsible for what, and uh, and then legal guarding position, do we move into shooters, et cetera? Uh, and does that contact um, affect the shot? If so, we should put air in the whistle. I believe this is a foul, uh, properly called, except I believe it should come from lead uh, at a minimum or more potentially C, and trail should defer in this case. On this play, it's along the same theme as the, the last play in uh, the area of primary coverage and uh, partner trust and who's responsible for having the initial ruling or initial uh, thoughts on a particular play. So in this case, you see we have a backdoor cut and then another uh, pass off to the lead side, and we're going to have a foul called uh, by the lead here. And I think it's definitely uh, an A to B foul um, by one player and the other player may potentially get him in the arm as well. So um, definitely a shooting foul, definitely one, one we want called. Lead is in excellent position. Trail is as well. I like the position of Justice Trail. Center, great position. Uh, just overall as a crew, we're in, we're in perfect position to officiate this, this action. The only thing I would say again is understand what our primary coverage areas are who's responsible for what, who has the initial uh, look and should make an initial determination on a call or no call. In this case, this is very clearly in the leads primary area and trail, we should definitely defer to lead and let them have first crack at this. On the bright side, we just post and hold. If we call something from trail, we don't want uh, to have a preliminary signal because if the lead calls something different, then we're going to have a blarge and that is ugly. We don't want that. Um, so at least in this case, we just um, blow and hold. We can get out of that if, if need be, but the preference would be to allow lead to have the uh, first crack at this and trust them uh, to make a call or no call in their primary area of responsibility. On this last play, the crew does a really nice job of positioning and mechanics and just overall consistency of judgment. So we've talked about on previous plays that if we have similar plays 
on each end of the floor, we want to call them similarly. Now, that doesn't mean make things up. If one play is clearly different from another, then it's going to require a different ruling. In this particular case, we're going to have a nice clean block up top by 23, and then we're going to come down and transition. We're going to have a pretty clear A to B foul by the defensive player number 11. So these are different plays. We have a clean block, and then we have an A to B foul on the other end. So just because we have a clean block on the other end doesn't mean we should no call this on this other end. If they're similar, then we should call them similarly. And uh, in this case, uh, we do a nice job of no calling the clean block and then calling the A to B foul on the other end. And then our front court positioning and adjustment on the the one end is excellent. You'll notice that the trail, uh, the new trail works beneath the matchup, then hustles to his new position to uh, get into a spot where he needs to be to assist. The rest of the crew is in great position. And then when we come back and transition, we've talked about this many times that if you can't get to the end line, let's stop about the free throw line extended and take it from the typical center position. And that's exactly what this official does. The new lead in transition stops at the free throw line and takes the play from there. So this is excellent mechanics. This is exactly what we want to see. Good judgment, good position adjust. A good job of not anticipating a foul on this block and then getting down to the other end, knowing we're not going to get to the end line, stopping and taking it from the free throw line extended area. The only thing I would say to be picky is once we call the foul, let's close on the action. The new C does an outstanding job of hustling to get down there into that position to assist with dead ball officiating. But if we're the calling official, let's take a couple steps towards the action, close, do our spot mechanics and then communicate with our partner that we're shooting to and number one is the shooter. But overall, this is an excellent job of officiating on this sequence uh, by the whole crew. Just really nice job on both ends, exactly what we want to see. Okay, that will do it for training tape number six. Again, this is not for, for credit. You can view all of the training tapes, including this one, on the MSHSL official's YouTube account or using the link on the, uh, on the memo as well. Uh, again, doing a great job out there. Keep up the good work on working with players and coaches. We've talked about taunting as a, an emphasis. That means uh, directed at an opponent, choreographed or prolonged, and that's actions or verbal. We're not going to give out technicals because we looked at somebody wrong. Um, we can certainly talk to them and work with them uh, on that. But if they scream at somebody or get in their face um, and direct behaviors or actions at an opponent, then that definitely would qualify for uh, a warning for sure. But if not, a technical foul would definitely be supported. So um, keep that in mind as we uh, as we move into February. This is when it gets to be really tough. It's been a long season. Um, you know, coaches and players are tired. Officials are tired. Uh, let's keep that in mind as we work with people. At the same time, uh, don't don't allow them to cross the line. And if they do, we need to to take care of business uh, relative to that. So, uh, have a great weekend and uh, keep up the good work as we move into February. And we will talk to you next week.